Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vantage Seminar. And we're continuing our series of talks on perspectives on Gawa groups. And today we're very happy to have Andrew Obus, who's speaking on Abiyankar's conjecture and fundamental groups. And Andrew, is it okay if we record this talk? Uh, yes, that's fine. Oh, great. And feel free to ask questions during the talk. So Andrew, please go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, so it's it's great to be here. I've been I've been coming on and off to Vantage Seminar since it started three years ago, and uh, it's it's been, it's really nice to be able to speak here. Um, so this talk is going to be you know mostly a survey talk, and a little bit at the end uh, about about stuff that I've done, but mostly mostly a general survey talk. Uh, and I, I see I see I see David Harbader's in the audience, so he'll keep me honest if I say anything imprecise uh, over here. Uh, so maybe. Uh, so I'm going to talk about it's Abiyankar's conjectures and fundamental groups, but despite the title, I'll talk about fundamental groups first, and then I'll talk about Abiyankar's conjectures, and then uh, and then you say something about lifting to characteristic zero, which is not really an Abiyankar's conjecture, but it is related, and there's been kind of a recent a recent you know interesting result there that I want to talk about. Um, so I'm going to give a very short bibliography. If if you look at Abiyankar on MathSciNet, he's got lots and lots and lots of papers and, and lots of papers that are relevant to what we're talking about. But I decided I'm going to pick out three papers from all from the bulletin of the AMS. So they're all expository papers that can then direct you to other papers that you might want to read about this stuff. So there's you know two papers by Abiyankar, uh, one called Gawa Theory and the Line in Non-Zero Characteristic, which is mostly going to be the subject of this talk. Uh, a later paper called Resolution of Singularities in Modular Galois Theory, which also touches on some of the same material in the earlier paper and has, you know, uh, quite a bit of historical context there. And then a more recent paper that uh, that I wrote with with Rachel, who's organizing, and David is here, and Kate Stevenson, called uh, Abiyankar's Conjectures in Galois Theory, Current Status and Future Directions. And I would just say that if you've, if you've never read anything by Abiyankar, I mean, these... I highly recommend reading, you know, one or both of these bulletin of the American Mathematical Society papers. They're just uh, his voice is is not replicated anywhere. It's just a, you feel like you're in a conversation with him. I never met him, so the, the closest I've ever gotten to a conversation with him is reading these papers, and it's really it's quite an experience. So I, I highly recommend it. Okay, so the beginning point is just uh, topological fundamental groups. Basically, the only the only types of uh, of geometric objects we're going to talk about today are, you know, the, the fundamental group of uh, X, where here X is going to be a punctured Riemann surface of genus G with R holes that we're generally going to call of type GR. Uh, base points are never going to be important for anything we do today, so I'm always going to suppress them. Um, and you know, what is what is the standard picture here? Right, you have you have your little Riemann surface here and it has you know however many holes it has and maybe there's another hole over here dot 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 and then it ends over here maybe with another hole and you know you have your standard picture where you've got at for each hole you have a loop kind of going around the handle like this and you have another loop uh going around the hole itself like this and i mean i'm not you you can have all of these loops coming from a base point i'm not going to draw the base point just because it's going to it's going to you know clutter the picture and there's not that much space for it and then well you also can have you know certain missing points so you can have a missing point that I'll draw with a little green star here and if you have a missing point then you have another loop going around that green star and i think most people have probably uh seen this this computation but what do you have all of these loops uh if you label them call this say a1 you call this b1 and you call this star over here, C1, and then you do similar things for the other holes and for the other missing points, then what you get is that pi one of X is going to be uh, generated by these generators, A1, B1, up through A, G, B, G. Uh, and then with another generator for each of these uh, loops around the missing points, so C1 up through CR, and then this is going to be quotiented out by the product of the commutators from i equals 1 to g of a i and b i. So you take the product of the commutators and you multiply that by c1 up through cr. Okay, and this group is important enough that we're going to give it a name. We're going to call this pi gr. Okay. And one thing to notice is that uh, if R is at least one, so if this is missing some point, if this is not complete, then this group, which has this kind of complicated looking presentation, is actually just a free group on 2G plus R minus one generators. 
because what you have from this expression is that CR, for instance, is just equal to some expression in the other generators, and that gets rid of the that gets rid of the generator CR. It gets rid of the relation, and what you're left with here is just a free group. Okay, um, and uh, so you know free groups are nice. It's easy to know what groups are. Uh, quotients of free groups. It's just groups that are generate. A finite, a finite group is a quotient of a free group on some number of generators if it can be generated by that many generators. Um, so, so recall that when we're in the world of topology, we have a universal cover x tilde over x on which this pi one x acts freely. It acts by these dex transformations and x is equal to the quotient of the universal cover by this group. And so in particular, each finite index normal subgroup of pi one of x corresponds to a finite topological cover of x with deck transformation group pi one of x mod h. Okay, so, um, so when we have these finite normal subgroups, uh, finite index normal subgroups, we get a finite group as the quotient and that's going to be the group of deck transformations. Okay, so this is the, the topological story. And uh, in algebra, of course, it's hard to talk about homotopy classes of loops in algebraic geometry. And so instead, you have to build the theory of the fundamental group from the idea of covering spaces. And again, you can't talk about covering spaces directly from the uh, from the topological definition because the Zariski topology is too coarse. But instead, use what are called finite atoll covers. Uh, and explicitly, when is a cover atoll? It just means locally the cover Y is cut out over X by N polynomials and N variables such that the Jacobian matrix of those polynomials is invertible basically means it's going to be flat and unramified. And uh, and what this means, what you want to think is that, you know, on C points uh, gives a uh, topological cover. Okay, and I'm not going to be super careful with this. In all of the examples that we're going to see, it's going to be very clear what's going on. Uh, and then what we want to say is that, uh, what does it mean for a finite cover to be Galois? Well, if you have a finite tall cover, Y to X, and you look at the automorphism group of Y over X, then we say that it's Galois with that group as its Galois group, if the Galois group acts transitively on the fibers. And then how do we define the fundamental group, well, we don't have a universal cover in the sense of a nice, you know, map from some variety down to X, which is just given by an algebraic map. But instead, we can just look at all of the Galois covers Y to X, and we can define the algebraic fundamental group of X to be the inverse limit of uh, all of these automorphism groups when you take it over the system of all Galois covers from Y to X. Uh, and what's going to be important for us in this talk is that... Uh, you know, let, let me say, sorry, G here is a finite group. So G, a finite group, is going to be the Galois group of a cover if and only if G is a quotient of pi one, this algebraic fundamental group of X. So in this talk, we're going to be talking a lot about what groups appear as Galois groups of covers. And uh, that's going to be uh, exactly the same thing as saying that that group is a quotient of the fundamental group. Okay, so... Uh, let me just say something. These were all about, you know, topological covers, a call a tall covers. Let me just say something quickly uh, about branched covers. So if X is a smooth connected affine curve with a smooth projective completion, which we'll call X bar, then if you have a finite a tall cover of X, you can always extend it to a finite morphism Y bar to X bar, where these are the smooth projective completions. Uh, and that may no longer be an atoll cover, but it will be still a finite morphism that we call a branched cover because it might not have this unramified property at these extra points. Uh, and if the original cover is G Galois, then this new cover also has the, the group G acting on Y and, and fixing X. And the stabilizer of a given point here is called the inertia group at that point. So for, by our construction, of course, for any point in Y, the stabilizers are just trivial, but for these extra points that you add on, they can have non-trivial inertia groups. And as a matter of language, we'll refer to the inertia groups of this branch cover as the inertia groups of the original cover. So if I say the inertia groups of Y over to Y to X, that means the inertia groups of these extra points on this branch cover. Okay, so one fact is that when we're working over the complex numbers, the inertia groups of a cover are always cyclic. Uh, you can prove this kind of topologically, or you can think of this, this is related to, you know, the, the, the fact that if you take extensions of the Laurent series field over T, uh, then this, this group is always going to be cyclic. 
Uh, so, and in particular, if, if my, if X is actually just P1 minus some points so that its closure is P1, and then we have uh, a Galois cover Y to X, then these inertia groups are going to generate the Galois group of the cover. The idea being, if you mod out by all the inertia groups, then you get some new cover that's unramified, uh, but it's an unramified cover of P1 and none of those exist. So that means that you have to have killed the entire cover. And that means that those inertia groups are gonna generate the Galois group of the cover. Okay, so what's kind of specifically in characteristic zero, you know, how does this work? Well, the Riemann existence theorem shows that if X is a smooth algebraic curve over C, and if I then have a topological, a finite topological cover of the C points of X, then this topological cover is actually the C points of some algebraic curve Y, and you actually have an algebraic morphism from y to x and a finite algebraic morphism that's going to give you uh, this topological cover. So in particular, is essentially every topological cover is just an algebraic cover. And so if you want to understand what is this algebraic fundamental group, remember this was the inverse limit of all of the Galois groups of all of the algebraic covers, but you can just look at all of the topological covers instead because all of those are algebraic covers. And so what you end up getting is that uh, this becomes the profinite completion of the topological fundamental group of X considered as a complex manifold, because all of those Galois, every finite uh, quotient of pi one algebraic of X is going to be a finite quotient of this topological fundamental group. And then you're taking the inverse limit. So that's going to give you the profinite completion. Uh, and in fact, we don't need to be over the complex numbers to do this. Everything here works over any arbit arbitrary algebraically closed field of characteristic zero. And uh, in this case, uh, so uh, the isomorphism class of pi one algebra of X depends only on this type GR of X, right? This is the, the type, remember G is the genus and R is the number of missing points. And we call this group pi GR, I mean, we don't call it, it is pi GR hat. Remember pi GR was this topological fundamental group and now we're taking its profinite completion. And I'll say the inertia group types also don't depend on this base field either, that they're, they're always going to be cyclic. Okay, so this is kind of the story over algebraically closed fields of characteristic zero. In character, there's in characteristic P, of course, you know, it's it's extremely hard to talk about loops or anything like that. But the definitions that we have of finite atal cover completely make sense in characteristic P. In the end, things depend on Jacobian matrices and derivatives, and everything's a polynomial, and we know how to take derivatives of polynomials no matter what characteristic you're over. So let's say that we have a curve of type GR over an algebraically closed field of characteristic P, and let's say that its smooth projective completion is this curve X bar of genus G. And from now on, we're only gonna be talking about algebraic fundamental groups, so I'm not gonna write the algebra. I'm just gonna write pi one of X when I mean the algebraic fundamental group, okay? So as we know, this pi one of X, the way we defined it, we look at all of the Galois finite etal covers, and we look at the inverse limit of the automorphism groups of those covers. So we can get various quotients of pi one of X by only taking the inverse limits over some of these finite etal covers, not over all of them. So if we instead only look at the Galois covers whose inertia groups are prime to P, we get this quotient that we call the tame fundamental group of X. And if we go even stricter and we only take the inverse limit over Galois covers whose degrees are prime to P, right, which is stricter than just saying that the inertia groups are prime to P, then we obtain this, just we call this the maximal prime to P quotient. Uh, so that's the P prime there of pi one of X. So we have kind of a big fundamental group, pi one of X. We have some smaller quotient, this pi one tame of X. And then we have this even smaller quotient, which is the prime to P fundamental group of X. Okay. Um, and so what's the big theorem? Uh, the idea is how do you calculate these? I mean, it's very hard to like figure out algebraically what are all of these finite etal covers and take the inverse limit of their Galois groups. Basically not something you can really do except in, in very specific cases. So what's nice is that we have a comparison theorem to what's going on in the topological case where in topology, we know how to calculate these things because we draw loops and we have these groups uh, pi GR, right? So the comparison theorem says, that recall just this pi GR is the fundamental group of a, sorry, I don't want to say a curve, sorry. Uh, let me say a Riemann surface. 
Riemann surface of type GR over C, and this is going to be the topological fundamental group that we originally defined. And so now if X is a curve of type GR over an algebraically closed field of characteristic P, and this actually works over characteristic zero also, where you just define the tame fundamental group to be the full fundamental group, then there's a surjective homomorphism from uh, the profinite completion of this group to the tame fundamental group of X. And in particular, this is an isomorphism on the maximal prime to P quotients. So... This tells us exactly what the maximal prime to P quotient of the fundamental group of, uh, of a curve X is, right? Because of, of a nice smooth curve X is, because it's just the same as the maximal prime to P quotient of this group, which we have an explicit presentation for. Okay, so let me let me just say something. So, so for example, uh, I can say that a finite prime to P group Uh, is a quotient of pi 1x if and only if it is a quotient of this pi gr, right? Uh, or equivalently, equivalently a quotient of pi gr prime. The finite quotients are the same when I take the profinite completion. Uh, and so in particular... And what's what is what's a consequence of this? So if G has a finite prime to P quotient, if G has a profinite prime to P quotient H, then uh, G is a quotient of pi one of X only if. Uh, H is a quotient of pi gr, right? Because if G is a quotient of pi 1x, then H, which is a quotient of G, is certainly a quotient of pi 1x, and H is a prime to P group. So you certainly have to have that H is going to be a quotient of pi gr also, okay? So in particular, this gives us a restriction on what types of groups can be quotients of pi one of X, meaning what types of groups can be the, the Galois group of an etal Galois cover of a finite etal Galois cover of X. At the very least, you have to be able to check all of their prime to P quotients and know that those groups are quotients of the standard topological fundamental group for, for a Riemann surface of that type. Okay. Um, so uh, maybe before, before I move on to examples of this, any questions so far? Sounds good. good. Okay. Oh, yeah, no, right. go ahead, Drew. Yeah, do you have a question? Right. Oh, is there a question? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. So let's just do, okay. So let's do an example. So we've been talking about characteristic zero on these tame covers. What is weird in characteristic P? Well, you have this classic example. So let's say that X is the affine line over K with K algebraically closed of characteristic P. Note that, of course, if K is characteristic zero, the affine line has trivial fundamental group because it's just C, which is simply connected uh, or over some algebraically closed field of characteristic zero. But here, if I take the cover uh, Y to X, where this is just given by the equation Y to the P minus Y equals X, and X is affine line over K, which we're thinking of as the X line, then this Y to X is, this has an action, Y goes to Y plus one, uh, because we're in characteristic P. Uh, so this is a Z mod P action generated by Y going to Y plus one. Uh, so this turns out to be a Z mod P Gawa cover. It's certainly a tall because what is this generated by? It's generated by this one equation, uh, Y to the P minus Y equal X. And if I take the partial derivative with respect to Y of this equation, I just get one <laughs> everywhere, right? So this certainly does not vanish. When I say of the equation, I really mean I'm taking the partial derivative with respect to y of y to the p minus y minus x of the, the function that cuts this out. So this does not vanish. So this is certainly an etal cover. And you can check, I mean, of course, that each point on the affine line has exactly p preimages because you just take any one preimage and then you just add one to it until you've cycled through z mod p. 
Okay, so, um, yeah, so so this is uh, sorry, sorry, I just knocked some things over on the table. Okay, so um, okay, so this is a Z mod P cover, and it turns out that the inertia group at infinity which I'm not going to calculate explicitly, but this inertia group at infinity is Z mod P. So it's not prime to P. Okay. And so in fact, we can replace this X. I can replace this X with any N that I want. And, uh, you know, as turns out that as N runs through uh, as n runs through uh, the natural numbers, or maybe at least uh, the natural numbers that are not divisible by p, these covers are all uh, linearly disjoint. So you can take their composita, you can take their fiber products, and what you end up getting from this is actually that z mod p to the a uh, is a quotient of pi one of the affine line uh, for all A in the natural numbers, because I can just take the composita of as many of these covers as I want. I take y one to the p minus y equals x, and then y two to the p minus y equals x squared, and so on. And I just take all of these, I take their normalization, and uh, what I'm gonna get is gonna be a cover that's gonna have this product of Z mod P's as its, uh, as its, uh, as its Galois group. And so in particular, this is telling us that the, the fundamental group of the affine line is not finitely generated, because if it was finitely generated, it would have some number of generators, and uh, I wouldn't, that would contradict me being able to take A arbitrarily high. Um, so what we see here is that arbitrary finite powers of ZP appear as quotients of the fundamental group of A1. And I'll say, in fact, there are some interesting non-abelian examples as well. So let me just say, we'll also take y to x. Here, I'm going to take the cover y to the n minus a x to the s y to the t uh, plus 1 is going to be equal to 0. And this x here is going to be, again, the x line. And here, what do I have? I have that t is not 0 mod p. Uh, and I have that n here is equal to p plus t. So it turns out that this is a tall. This is a kind of fun exercise. I'm not going to do the calculation, but just take the partial derivative of this with respect to y, and you can show that anywhere that that vanishes is not actually a point where the equation itself vanishes. It's fun to do, so I'll, I'll leave it to you. Uh, so this is a tall, and if we take the Galois closure, meaning just take the Galois closure of function fields and then take the normalization of A1 in that Galois closure, the Galois group can be, uh, it can be a lot of different things. It can be PSL2 of P, it can be PSL2 of eight, and it can be SN and it can be AN, and this is all depending uh, on T and P, and I could write the actual covers and give you the exact cases, but it's not going to matter that much. The point is that we take this Galois closure, it's still an atoll cover, it's still an atoll cover of A1, so we get these Galois covers in characteristic P with these very interesting Galois groups, PSL2P and psl 2 a and the symmetric group and the, and the alternating group. So we're not just having abelian things. Uh, the inertia groups here are going to be some interesting semi-direct products of, uh, of P groups with cyclic prime to P group. So we get all of these like funky groups that do appear as Galois groups of branch covers of A1. In particular, there are quotients of the, fu of the fundamental group of A1 of K. Uh, and so a natural question to ask is, what finite groups G can appear as quotients of pi 1 of A1 of K? In particular, for what finite groups G, uh, not in particular, but equivalently, for what finite groups G do there exist G Galois covers of A1K? Okay. And we already have a necessary condition, which is that all of the prime to P quotients of G, they'd better appear as Galois groups of uh, A1 in characteristic zero. This is what we said earlier. 
but there are no groups. Only the trivial group is a is a is a cover of a one and characteristic zero. So that means that when we uh, that any prime to p quotient of this group G had better be trivial. Okay. So, question is, does everything else appear? And now let me start. Uh, oh, what did, did I do? I have this, this uh, slide should not be there. Uh, okay. Oh, no, I did. This slide should be here. Yeah. So I want to say, just note from the examples above that we have that Z mod P to the N is a quotient from of pi one of A1. So that means it's not topologically finitely generated, which means in particular that understanding these finite quotients, like what groups are these finite quotients is a nice question, but it does not necessarily give us a full understanding of the group. You'd only have that if, if it was topologically finite generated. So if, if you really wanted to understand pi one of A1, you need to understand embedding problems, but I'm not really going to have time to go into that. So let me just leave that as a little nugget for now. So what is Abiyankar's philosophy re regarding finite Galois covers? Okay, so Abiyankar got his start doing resolution of singularities in characteristic P under Zariski. And he uh, and in the course of trying to resolve singularities on surfaces, he would look at um, he would look at various curves and surfaces. And in uh, in the course of his resolutions, he came across a lot of these weird covers uh, of curves in characteristic P. And after seeing enough examples of this, he, he developed this philosophy that says that well, groups that shouldn't be the Galois, Galois group of a cover are in fact not. And groups that shouldn't not be the Galois group of a cover, in fact, are. So it's kind of a Murphy's Law type philosophy. If there's no reason why this thing shouldn't be the Galois group of a cover, then it probably is. Maybe slightly more formally, although the real formal statement is on the next slide, a finite group should appear as a quotient of a fundamental group in characteristic P, if and only if its maximal prime to P quotient appears as a quotient of the corresponding fundamental group in characteristic zero. And so this philosophy was informed by a great deal of examples that Abiyankar originally encountered while studying resolution of singularities on surfaces in characteristic P. So let me give you the actual statement of what this conjecture is for affine varieties. So if we have an algebraically closed field of characteristic P and a finite group, so I'm going to let P of G be the subgroup of G generated by its P silo subgroups, okay? So suppose uh, suppose X is a curve of type GR over K with R greater than or equal to one. So this conjecture by Abiyankar, and in fact, really Abiyankar only conjectured the A1 case of this. So that would be a curve of type zero one, but it was generalized and proved by, by Harbader and Raynaud. Raynaud did the A1 case and Harbader did the rest. Uh, that a group is a quotient of pi one of X if and only if G mod P of G can be generated by 2G plus R minus one elements. So this is exactly like the minimal thing you would possibly have to ask for, right? You're going to be a quotient of pi one of X if and only if when you mod out by the stuff that's generated by your P silo subgroups, okay? So you're taking the maximal prime to P quotient of your group, that thing had better be able to be generated by 2G plus R minus one elements, meaning it better show up as a characteristic zero fundamental group of a curve of type GR. So let me just say, particularly case of X equals A1 of K, uh, then uh, G is a quotient of pi one of A1 K, if and only if, well, in this case, G is equal to zero and R is equal to one. So G mod PG has to be generated by zero elements, which means it has to be the trivial group. So this is a quotient of pi one of AK if and only if uh, G is equal to PG. And we have a name for groups like this. These are called quasi P groups. Okay. And what are examples of quasi P groups? Well, certainly P groups are quasi P groups. So this tells you that every P group is uh, a quotient of pi one of the affine line in characteristic P. Uh, simple groups, uh, G, where uh, P divides the order of G, for instance. These are going to be quasi P, because if you take the subgroup of G generated by all its P silo subgroups, well, that's going to be a characteristic subgroup, because I just told you what it was, so it's characteristic. And that means it's normal. And if this is a simple group where P divides the order of G, that means that group has to be the whole thing. So if you take G mod out by PG, then, uh, then, then you get a quasi P group. 
And there are other groups, other types of semi-direct products that are not simple and are not P groups where you have this, but maybe these are the two most interesting uh, families uh, of examples. Okay, so all of these groups are going to show up as Galois groups of covers. So in characteristic 29, the monster group is going to show up as the cover of as the Galois group of a cover of the affine line, uh, which is which is kind of great. Um, so so this is the conjecture. Uh, and um, what I want to say, if there's one thing to take away from the talk, I want you to take away again the only if easy direction of this of this proof which I'm just going to write briefly. So G is a, so what's the only if we want to say that if G is a quotient of pi one of X, then G mod PG can be generated by two G plus one elements. So I basically said this, but let me just write this down so that it's on the slides. So G is a quotient of pi one of X. This implies from what we have before that G modulo, it's group generated by the PC lows. This certainly is a quotient of pi one of X, which implies that G mod PG is a quotient, uh, quotient of pi one, uh, sorry, sorry, as a quotient of pi GR, which implies that G mod PG is generated by uh, two G plus R minus one elements. Okay, um, so this is the easy direction of Abiyankar's conjecture. The hard direction, of course, is, okay, I'll give you some group like the monster group over the affine line in characteristic 29, and you give me a cover whose Galois group is the monster group, right? So this, of course, seems, you know, quite a bit, uh, quite a bit harder to do. Okay, so I'm not going to do the proof in any detail because we don't have time, but I want to just talk a little bit about the techniques for, for the hard direction here. So, you know, one technique is group cohomology and embedding problems, which basically says if you've got your fundamental group and you have a quotient here, G mod H, and I have some group G going here, when, what do I know about filling in this diagram? Okay, it's kind of when can I do it? Can I fill it in with a surjection, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is one thing that you're going to use. There's formal and rigid patching, which if you were at David Harbader's first talk in this series, you heard a little bit about, but... All that I'm going to say is that this is kind of gluing together uh, covers over non-Archimedean fields uh, you know, where overlap is not on a Zariski open. So these are a couple of different ways of doing this, but you know the picture here is if downstairs you have kind of like two pieces, and then upstairs, well maybe I have some some branched cover over this piece, like this, and then I have some other cover over this piece over here. Well, if these were just you know topological spaces, I would say well oh this these covers over this part and this cover over this part, their overlaps are isomorphic, so I can glue them together. And formal and rigid patching are various ways to make that reasonable over non-Archimedean fields where your overlaps are over metric disks or annuli or something like that. Um, and then the other technique that we have is, is semi-stable models, uh, which again, I'm not going to say too much about, but the idea is, uh, you know, uh, you know, this is some kind of controlled bad reduction to characteristic P. Uh, and, you know, so to just your basic example is if I have, you know, the hyperbola given by X, Y equals P in characteristic zero, then I can look at the reduction is going to be given by X, Y equals zero. And this looks like the meeting of these two axes. And this is semi-stable, which just basically means that it's reduced. Uh, and the only singularities are ordinary double points. Okay, so how do these things show up? Well, I'm gonna give very, very brief uh, high level overview of the proof. So this slide, I think I'm mostly gonna skip for time, but you know, the first the first breakthrough on this on, on this proof is Sarah who did the solvable case, uh, which basically says that if you have some big group G and you can write it in an exact sequence, if H is solvable 
And if you can realize G mod H as a quotient of pi one, then you can also realize G. Uh, and basically what this relies on is that this fundamental group has cohomological dimension one, which is a consequence of a tall cohomology. And that means it's projective as a group. And that means that you can in fact lift morphisms from pi one to G mod H to morphisms from pi one to G, but you have to make sure that that's surjective. And so you have to do some creative twisting and stuff to make sure that it's surjective, but it turns out that you can do it. I think I'm not gonna talk about any details here. Uh, you can find this and it's a very short paper in the Comte Rondeau, it's five pages. So you can read this if you want, but basically, so we can reduce to the case that G doesn't have any normal uh, any, any normal subgroups of order divisible by P, which, which is important in one of the, the later cases. So once you've uh, done the solvable case and we're only talking about A1, then for the affine line case, we have Raynaud's first idea. And the first idea is this thing that to me is still hard for me to really grok the motivation for, uh, for, for trying these two things, but uh, for, for dividing the proof up into these two cases. But basically if you have a PCLO subgroup of G and if you let G of S inside G be, be generated by all of the proper quasi P subgroups of G whose PCLO subgroups are contained in S. So this is just take some group G, you can make this group S. And then we have this dichotomy, this group G of S can be either equal to G or it can be not equal to G. Uh, and if it's, and note that this only depends on G because all the PC lows are conjugate. So this construction of G of S will be equal or not equal to G. It's not going to depend on which conjugate of S you take as your PC low group. Uh, and then basically what happens is that if this G of S is equal to G, then you can construct a bunch of smaller covers with proper subgroups G I with PC lows contained in S. And you can do an inductive argument, assume that you've got these Galois covers for all of these small groups. Uh, you can, in fact, assume that the inertia groups are P groups, PI by Abiyankar's lemma, which I can't really go into. And then it turns out that you can, you want to like patch these different covers over K into a big cover over K. But K is just an algebraically closed field of characteristic P, so it's not necessarily non-Archimedean. So you have to use rigid patching over, over make it non-Archimedean, throw in Laurent series in some extra vari variable or in an extra variable, you can patch them together to a G cover. This G of S equals G is completely important for making the construction work. Although of course, there's not enough time to really understand why that's true. Uh, and once you have this cover over K double parentheses T, you're basically taking a specialization of T in, in so many words, uh, in order to get a cover over K. You're just specializing T to some value. Um, that's a bit of a lie, but but that's more or less what you're doing. Okay, so so the point is just that having this condition is very important to be able to like patch these covers together and make the cover that you want with Galois group G. Now, the second idea, uh, we have to assume for this that G doesn't have a non-trivial normal P subgroup, which is based on SER. And now you have to assume that G of S is not equal to G. And this turns out to be very important. And what you do is you just build some cover in characteristic zero. And it's easy to build covers in characteristic zero because we know what the fundamental group is in characteristic zero. And because your G is a quasi P group, it means that it can be generated by P groups. You know, it's generated by some P groups. So you can build a cover in characteristic zero where all the inertia groups are P groups. And so those will generate G, so that's kosher. And so then anything you can do over C, you can basically view over any algebraically closed field in characteristic zero. And in particular, you can defend you can descend it to some finite extension of the fraction field of the vid vectors over K. This is just a discrete valuation ring in characteristic zero whose residue field is K. So if you look at its fraction field and take the algebraic closure, that's an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero. And well, you can always go to just some finite extension if you want. And it turns out that if you build this cover correctly and you take a semi-stable model of this cover and you look at the uh, the special fiber what the, of, of this cover, which lives over K, well, downstairs you're gonna have you're gonna have some, you know, some like little tree-like diagram with P1. And upstairs, you know, you're gonna have whatever you have with this cover, right? This is W and this is to, you know, P1 of this this field, which maybe I'll just call F for now. But then over one component, you're gonna have this little branch over here where the only branching point, or this is gonna be the only ramification point here. Here, 
And this down here is gonna be just a copy of P1 of K. And then it turns out that this cover over here is exactly the cover that you want. If you get rid of the branch point and just look at this as a cover of A1 of K, by some miracle, using the fact that you have assumed that this G of S is not equal to G, that exactly gives you that the you have the full uh, G action on this component. Okay, so that gives you that you, you have the full G action on this component. You could, in theory, have you know a bunch of different connected components where just some subgroup of G acts on all of them. But actually here you get the, the full G action on this component. And so somehow this G of S being equal to G is exactly what you need to make the rigid patching argument work. And then G of S not equal to G is exactly what you need to make this semi-stable reduction argument work. And I mean, I've read the paper and I've, I've verified it line by line, but it would be a lie for me to say that I really understand, you know, what is the meaning of this G of S equals G and, and why, why does, you know, why, why does it separate these two cases? So in any case, though, this is what proves uh, Abiyankar's conjecture uh, for the affine line. Uh, you, you break it up into these two cases and that works. And then uh, how do you do it in general? Well, it turns out that this is David Harbader's proof that the key case is type 0, 2, which is the affine line minus, uh, minus a point. And unfortunately, I think I'm just going to have to more or less skip this the area of the proof. But the idea is that you glue, uh, once, once you've proven, uh, once you've realized everything over A1 without 0, which you have to use Abiyankar's conjecture over A1 in order to build that in the first place, then you basically, to do the general case, you glue a copy over A1 without zero to a, a prime to P cover of your type GR curve, whatever that is. The prime to P covers are easy to understand. The A1 of K without zero covers you've done before, and you have to do them in a clever way so that you know you get the exact compatibilities that you need in order to be able to patch these covers together. Okay, but unfortunately, I'm not going to really have time to to go through any details of these proofs. So, um, okay, so this is the uh, this is the this is the uh, uh, this is the, this is the proof of Abiyankar's conjecture, very very sketched at at the highest level. Um, good. Okay. So, all right, that's great. So, Abiyankar's conjectures tell us about groups that are Galois groups of covers of affine curves and characteristic zero. Um, so, of course, there's lots of other things that you could ask. So <clears throat> there, are, there are various generalizations of, uh, of, of this, which kind of the conjectures are consistent with this Abiyankar philosophy that whatever kinds of covers, you know, you could have, you should have. So there's something called Abiyankar's inertia conjecture, which I'll talk about on the next slide. There's something called Abiyankar's affine arithmetical conjecture. This is just the analog uh, of the Abiyankar conjecture. Abiyankar conjecture when K is equal to FP. So you have to take into account the arithmetic fundamental group there, but I'm probably going to skip my slide on that. And then there's Abiyankar's conjectures for higher dimensional schemes, uh, often, you know, uh, complements of hyperplane arrangements here. here. And here, sometimes the results are a little bit messier than, than what you have uh, in the inertia conjecture. But the point is that these complements of hyperplane arrangements are still kind of things where you can talk about a corresponding variety in characteristic zero to your variety in characteristic P. So you have PN minus some bunch of hyperplanes. You can do that in characteristic P, and you can take the same arrangement in characteristic zero and ask about how the fundamental groups of those two spaces compare. So maybe the inertia conjecture, I just want to say uh, slightly more about. So, so let uh, so suppose that we have a, a Gawa cover. I'm only going to talk about the case of P1 here. You can generalize this uh, to uh, general type GR curves, although Abiyankar didn't, but it's been done by some other people, uh, Manish Kumar and Sumyadip Das, to at least uh, you know phrase this uh, in terms of uh, for general curves. So if you have an inertia group. Um, then it, that inertia group and its conjugates have to generate G. Again, because if you mod out by the minimal normal subgroup generated by that inertia group, then you get 
uh, then you get a cover of A1 with no inertia. And that has to extend to an atoll cover of P1, which means it has to be the trivial cover. So that means you have to have modded out by the entire group G. So these things generate G. And uh, furthermore, you know something about the structure of these inertia groups. They can't just be any finite groups, even for these weird examples where G is the monster or the symmetric group or some linear algebraic group or whatever. The inertia groups have to look like P group, semi-direct, Z mod M, where M is prime to P. Okay, this is just basically because these are these are the, the Galois groups of extensions of uh, K double parentheses T. And so the inertia conjecture says, uh, if G is a quasi P group, well, we know that we can realize G as the Galois group of a cover of A1. But if we now take an allowable inertia subgroup, something like I, so we take a subgroup of the form P semi-direct product Z mod M such that I and its conjugates generate G, then the conjecture is that there exists a G cover of the affine line with an inertia group equal to I. Okay, and for short, we can just say that we can realize G comma I. So this, unlike Abiyankar's original conjecture, is still a conjecture. This is, I would say, wide open um, in terms of uh, some, some results on this. I'd say the biggest systematic results are this result of Harbader, which says, if you can realize some I, you can always enlarge the PCLO subgroup. So you can, if you take a bigger I that's still inside G, where the, the index is a power of P, then you can always realize G with this larger subgroup. So you can always, you know, increase the, the P CeeLo. And if, and alternatively, so this is a real theorem of Harbader. Uh, alternatively, if you can realize some GI and then you take some new I prime that has a smaller prime to P part. So you replace, you know, M here with some proper factor of M. Then, then you can realize that smaller group. And that's much, much easier. That's Abiyankar's lemma. Essentially, you just take a pullback by uh, a cyclic cover of A1 given by some nth power, and that's going to give it to you right there. So this is, this is easy. This is, uh, the, the first part is, is, is a real theorem. Um, so these are kind of the only systematic principles we really have to work with here. So you can make the P part bigger and you can make the prime to P part smaller. So what you want to do is try to find something with the smallest possible p part and the biggest possible prime to p part. And if you can do that, then you're well on your way to proving Abiyankar's conjecture for that particular group. So what do we know? Well, there's lots of results on individual groups. So uh, Rachel Pries and Irena Bao did PSL2P and AP. Uh, Pries and Muscat did AP plus two. For all of these, you need to assume you need to assume for all of these that p is congruent to two mod three. Uh, and then notice I, I wrote AP plus one after AP plus two. That's because it was proven afterward. So AP plus one up through AP plus five, these were all done by uh, Sumya Dipdas and Manish Kumar. Um, these are you know full results, at least for when the primes satisfy this. There's partial results uh, for some other groups. So this is a result of mine that if you have PSL2L with P dividing L, L squared minus one, then you get certain inertia groups that you can realize, but it's not all of them. So it's not really even a proof of Abiyankar's inertia conjecture for this group. And then there are results also for products of alternating groups A and I, where each alternating group has only a Z mod P as its CeeLo group, then you can realize what's called the purely wild inertia conjecture. You can at least realize all of the P groups uh, as inertia groups, all of the allowable P groups you can realize as inertia groups. But of course, that's kind of from the prime to P perspective, that's the easiest part because what you really want to do is realize the biggest possible prime to P part, and then you can get everything else. And I'll say that for most of these and the techniques are similar to what was done in the original Abiyankar conjecture. Sometimes you're using Abiyankar's explicit equations like that y to the n plus ax to the s, y to the t that we had earlier on, or you're looking at reductions in semi-stable models and trying to find this cover inside a semi-stable model of a cover. And I would say, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, that there's no real program to solve the entire conjecture. I don't think anybody has some philosophy that, oh, if we can do this, we're going to solve the entire conjecture. You know, most of the work seems to be kind of group by group. 
Uh, now, what I don't know, of course, is when the original Abiyankar conjecture was proved in 1994, I don't know if there was a program in the air to prove that either, or if nobody knew what to do, and then all of a sudden it was proved. Uh, it seems to me that it's likely to be the latter, but maybe uh, some of the people who were mathematically around back then can can tell me you know, what was going on there. Um, so who knows, somebody might just prove this, but, but I don't see any kind of like path, oh, if you can just do this and you can just do this, then, then you can solve the entire conjecture. Okay. So, uh, okay, the arithmetical conjecture I'm going to skip. Um, okay, so the last thing I want to say, and you know, probably not going to be able to say so much of this in five minutes, but I just want to give a little introduction, uh, is that we've already seen that in order to prove uh, the conjecture for affine curves, or for the affine line over an algebraically closed field and characteristic P, a key step involves realizing a G cover as an irreducible component of the reduction of a cover of curves from characteristic zero. This is the G of S not equal to G uh, part that the we use the semi-stable reduction. So in fact, you can actually realize a lot of G covers as reductions of, character, of covers in characteristic zero full stop. You don't need to take an irreducible component of some semi-stable model. You just, uh, you just realize the cover by like, making a, maybe a clever change of variables and then taking the reduction and you get what you get. Uh, and in fact, you can always do this as long as the inertia groups are primed to P. So this is basically saying if I have a branch cover of P1 where all the inertia groups are primed to P, I can always realize that as the reduction of a curve from characteristic zero. And this is more or less equivalent to this theorem of Grothendieck from the beginning of the talk that the fundamental group of an affine curve in characteristic P is a quotient of the corresponding uh, fundamental group in characteristic zero. So what's interesting is if you have wild, uh, I mean, if you have inertia groups that are not primed to P, can you realize these covers as uh, branch covers from characteristic zero? I have to in general have to generally show the the one example, which I'm just going to sketch. I'm not going to do it carefully. I'm just going to kind of work with equations without really defining what I'm doing. But the idea is if I let uh, you know, let me work over, you know, the vit vectors of K, uh, adjoin a pth root of unity, and I let lambda equal zeta P minus one. Then if I take the, the Z mod P cover, uh, let's call this R, uh, over R given by, uh, Z mod P, this is a branched cover cover over R given by Z to the P, it's a Coomer cover equals one plus Lambda to the P X. And then I make this change of variable Z equals one plus Lambda Y. Then I have here, this becomes one plus Lambda Y to the P equals one plus Lambda to the P X. And this becomes uh, one plus Lambda to the P Y to the P plus P Lambda Y plus uh, other stuff. But this other stuff, when I do these binomial coefficients, is all going to be uh, divisible by P and at least two factors of lambda. So it's going to vanish. You know, we'll see that it's going to vanish. This is going to be equal to uh, 1 plus lambda to the PX. And now if I cross out the 1s, and if I divide by lambda to the P, then this becomes essentially roughly minus 1. So P is roughly the same thing as lambda to the P minus 1. And then if I reduce mod P, then I get here that Y to the P minus Y, all the stuff is going to disappear because if I reduce, I shouldn't say mod P, I'm really reducing mod, uh, uh, sorry, I'm really reducing mod lambda. Uh, so I reduce mod lambda, then, then all of this stuff has at least... Uh, Lambda, it has at least P plus one copies of lambda over here because it got two lambdas and a P, which is P minus one copies. So you end up getting that Y to the P minus Y uh, is equal to X, uh, which is exactly what you want. So we start with a Coomer cover in characteristic zero. We end up with an Arden Schreier cover in characteristic P. I'm not doing this very carefully. You have to check that things stay smooth at infinity. Uh, you have to talk what it means to like reduce an equation to some other equation. But at the very least, maybe it's plausible that you have some cover in characteristic zero that if you just reduce it, you get this Z mod P Art and Schreier cover in characteristic P. So I know I'm just about out of time. Uh, so let me not even go through all of this. But a question is, what covers can you do this with? 
And it turns out that for cyclic covers, you can always do this, okay? This was a particular Z mod P cover, but for a cyclic cover, you can always do this. This was conjectured by Ort a while ago, and it's proven with collective work of Ort and Sekiguchi and Suva and Green and Matignon and Vavers and Pop and me. Um, so it turns out you can always do this for cyclic groups. Uh, and then the question is, uh, can you do this for dihedral groups of order, you know, two P to the N? So when we say an ORT group, this just means, you know, every uh, D P to the N uh, cover uh, comes in characteristic P comes as reduction from characteristic zero. Okay, that, that, that's what it means to be an ORT group. And so it's known for DP, and it's known for D9 and D25 and D27. And so I conjectured that it at some point it should be true for DP to the N. And it seems like there is a counterexample now. This is as of a few months ago. It seems like there is a counterexample for D125. And this is due to Kanto Georges and Terazakis. Okay, and since I only have two minutes, I'm not really gonna go over how to do it, but the idea is that they 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 write some D125 cover, uh, and that's gonna be, it turns out that this is branched at two points with inertia groups, Z mod two and D125. Um, and they show that if you look at the holomorphic differentials and you look at the canonical ideal inside there and you look, the, 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 the vector space of holomorphic differentials has a D125 action and they show there's no way to lift this representation to characteristic zero in a way that preserves the canonical ideal. And what that means is that if you take this, this top curve uh, as a canonically embedded cover, then uh, then there's no way to lift it as a canonically embedded <laughs> curve with this action. And they prove in an earlier paper that any lift is going to be able to be expressed as a lift of the canonical embeddings just by lifting the quadratic polynomials that generate this ideal uh, by Petrie's theorem. So basically they do this. And once you do all of this, it ends up boiling down to uh, the it, boiling down to linear algebra, showing that some representation on some vector space doesn't lift uh, with some properties. So, I guess the last thing I should say here is that when I was a postdoc, Johan de Jong was my advisor, and he I remember him saying that anybody who makes an incorrect conjecture should be flogged. Uh, and I guess that was, you should be very careful when you're calling something a conjecture. You should be absolutely certain it's true. So assuming this counterexample works and it's not published yet, it's still a preprint and it relies on a couple of papers that are also preprints, but I've read it and it seems it seems like it works to me, uh, then you know I deserve to be flogged. Uh, and I hope the mathematical community will have mercy on me and, and not carry that out. Okay, so question, can you obtain any reasonably nice criterion for when a DPN cover does or does not lift to characteristic zero? I thought the criterion was going to be, it always does, but it seems like that's not the case. So an interesting problem for now. Okay. Thank you for your attention. Uh, and thank you for having me here. Well, Andrew, I'm, I'm very glad you made that conjecture, whether or not it turns out to be true. Okay. <laughs> I should have called it a question, is the point. <laughs> it's not that you shouldn't say it, but I should, you should call it a question. <laughs> so let's see, would anyone like to ask a question? Actually, let me just make a comment about that last thing. So uh, Franz Ort has a similar philosophy. On the other hand, um, when I was a student and was at the Ohio State summer program, the Ross program, there we were told that you should not be too cautious or the opposite when making conjectures, and that therefore one third of your conjectures should be correct. <laughs> so that's a rather <laughs> different approach. Um, I may also mention, because you were asking about the history. Uh, yeah. So um, in the early 80s, there was a competing conjecture to uh, Abiancar's conjecture. And it turned out that they actually contradicted each other. So it was really unclear whether either or both was correct. So what was the competing conjecture? The, uh, the competing conjecture said that if you have a, a G Galois cover in characteristic P, uh, maybe it was for the line, and if you um, have a quotient group, sorry, if, if it's divisible by P, then it has to dominate a Z mod P cover. Mm -hmm. 
Ah. Uh, but that's not true because, for example, you wouldn't get a five. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and as far as expectations, so actually in 1990 at the 60th birthday conference for Abiyankar, Sayer presented the theorem that he, you described in the solvable case. And someone asked him, uh, well, could one soup this up to get the general case um, without assuming solvability for the kernel? And he said, no, because of non commutative issues. But he then went on to say something that startled me. I was in the audience and he said, uh, but if it's going to be proven, it'll be proven by different methods. Um, and therefore would probably, if it's done in the near future, what he said would be done by Michel Reynaud and David Harbader. <laughs> but the thing is he had been talking to the two of us because he knew we were each trying to use patching to get it. <laughs> okay. So, uh, <laughs> so he didn't just say that out of the blue. But on the other hand, it's not like we had a complete idea of how to do it. And in fact, with Raynaud, he didn't originally use that G of S. He originally had another method, which was longer, and used the structure theorem of finite abelian groups. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry. So structure, the sorry, the, the classification of, of finite simple groups. Uh, and um, so he used that. That was much more complicated. And then in trying to simplify it, he came up with this. So this was not the first thing he tried. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it, but it's something that certainly involved, you know, um, yeah, it, it was certainly not obvious, even if one was trying to think about patching in terms of. That. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting. I didn't know that. So, uh, Andrew, you looked at all at, um, you know, the cyclic part of this dihedral cover and then like with the Z mod 2 action on it. Has that have people? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so the, the cyclic part, um, right? So this 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 cyclic part here is this Z mod one hundred twenty five cover, and it has its its upper jumps for for the higher ramification filtration. Its upper jumps are nine forty five and two twenty five, so it's kind of like the the minimal possible cover in characteristic five with with the first upper jump being nine, um, and it's you know so so it's in in particular that there's these there are these results about deformations within characteristic p where you take a cover basically with very high genus and you can kind of deform it so that the local parts contribute less to the genus you're kind of spreading the ramification out over a bunch of points you can't do that with this cover it's kind of as it's as spread out as it's going to be uh and it's just like you write down you know the the representation you have to compute like what is this action on uh, what is what is this action uh, on on the the vector space of holomorphic differentials? And basically, I mean, of course, the cyclic covers do always lift, and so you can lift the cyclic part. And in order to be able to lift the dihedral part uh, to characteristic zero, you basically need these representations to come in pairs that are complementary in some sense. And just writes this down. He's like, well, look at this one. This one doesn't have a complement. You know, it's it's like they were searching that there's there's zero intuition for why this should be the first example, or is it the simplest example, or anything. Uh, but basically, yeah, cyclic wise, you can do this all, and then the dihedral part comes in and having to pair off these kind of irreducible parts of this representation, and there are a couple that just don't pair off. Uh, so it's certainly mysterious to me. But like once you understand this, I mean, they have it like written down how how you how you write down these these representations so you can put somebody who doesn't necessarily like a beginning grad student or something who doesn't really know much algebraic geometry you can have them just kind of like play with a computer and, and search these things and try to get some patterns i think they do i think they have some people in in greece who are who are doing this now um but for me there's zero intuition beyond well here are these like this representation has like 200 or 150 little parts, and here's one that doesn't have a partner. <laughs> um, so I, it was pretty shocking to me because, I mean, it, it means that there's some big system of equations, of polynomial equations in characteristic P of like 90 equations and 90 variables that are almost all homogeneous except for one of them, that you can't even find a single isolated solution over an algebraically closed field. Nothing to do with rationality, just the, these surfaces meet each other in a weird way and it seems I, don't know, I i was completely shocked and i have no intuition for why this example works oh thanks yeah. are there any other questions 
I mean, for instance, could you do DP squared? Is DP squared still always a local org group? I mean, that an org group. I mean, that's who knows. Uh, I mean, that's maybe something that you could answer by like playing with these representations, or maybe not. <laughs> maybe it just gets too miserable. Okay, well, let's thank Andrew again. And our next talk is December 19th. That's next week uh, by Naomi Coombs talking about uh, the Grotendieck Teichmuller group.